with Matt Boyce. He is the, the founder of the Human Connection Project. And you can imagine at a time like this, but just in general, why something like that is so crucial. Uh, so, Matt, welcome, welcome. And uh, thanks for still staying on. <laughs> all uh, good. Thanks for having me. That's all right. So can you just share, I know you did briefly before, but can you just share what you were before, you know, who you are and, and why the Human Connection Project has has come online? Yep, absolutely. So I guess I, I'll start from scratch again like we did earlier. Yeah. Matt Boyce, uh, Perth born, born and raised in West Oz. I was always the guy, um, you know, whether I was out surfing or on the footy field or uh, as a chippy, I was always bringing people together, have conversations around their mental health, to have conversations around their connection to their family, their friends. Like they, you know, talking about their whether they hated their job or just anything around their well-being was always a conversation we had. Then 10 years ago, I well, just over 10 years ago now, I moved over from Perth to Brisbane to chase the rugby league career. Uh, lasted a few years. It was probably a bit March. Didn't wasn't as good as what I thought I was. Uh, hung the boots up. But in the process of that, I kind of put on a bit of a mask. I put on a mask and pretended to be, you know, this tough guy football player, had the tattoos, like just this typical loser <laughs> um i kind of call myself now and i noticed i went from being the person that would bring people together to i was the guy sitting on his own at, at lunch um and what i did is i quite literally took the mask off and just went stuff that like i'm just going to go back to who i was regardless of who i think i have to be and i was skipping down the halls of the construction site singing whitney houston just absolutely belting it living my best life and i went from sitting a lot on my own to like one person sit next to me at lunch and then before i knew it, i had everyone on site sitting together and again the conversation started flowing about mental health their well-being etc etc sure. fast fast forward five years ago i lost my best friend uh justin in an accident and i went from being the facilitator of these conversations to being one who was like, oh, wow, well, like I'm not as connected as I pot potentially or perhaps thought I was. Uh, how many other people are going through this? And I had this epiphany or this realisation um, that most of society isn't, you know, really that connected. We feel like we know each other. Like, for instance, blokes will see each other on the pub once a week and they think they're connected. Or, you know, I see, yeah. my, I see my neighbour every day as I drive in the driveway, but I really know nothing about her. And this is kind of trickling out and everyone's feeling the same way. Uh, yeah. So what we're doing over the last five years, we've spoke to like leaders, best in the business, psychologists, therapists, speakers, counsellors, like everyone we can get a conversation with uh, and talk into this, this meaning of human connection because it's one thing for me to sit here and say, hey, guys, we need to get more connected as human beings. That's pretty easy to do. But then to actually figure out how, why, what are the, what are the outcomes, what are the inputs uh, is a whole other story. Yeah. So, so now that's essentially what we do every day is we are trying to build um, – you know, when we talk about BHAGs, our big, hairy, audacious goal is to build uh, the world's largest proactive, and I, I really like to bold and underline the word proactive, uh, human connection and mental health-led organisation because we're very, very reactive in our medical, in our mental health. Like everything we do is very reactive. Yes, yeah, couldn't agree more. And so I guess for you, because of where you are working, the field that you are working in, the conversations that you are having, what have you been hearing or seeing, you know, from the people that you've been speaking to just in the last couple of weeks? What have been the challenges popping up for people or the issues that they're concerned about? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting question. You know, this coronavirus, it's a two-edged blade for a lot of people, a two-edged sword. You know, some people are coming to me saying, like, this is the most connected I've ever felt because yeah. I'm getting... FaceTimes from friends in London who I haven't seen in you know four years that don't make don't make an effort to contact me normally yeah. because they've got their friends in their neighborhood. But then we're also seeing a lot of society is taking the words social distancing and self-isolation and confusing the two with uh, social disconnects. So they're just like we're shutting off from the world. We're sitting in our homes or isolating because it's you know what we're being told to do, but we're forgetting yeah. that we're hardwired as human beings, we're hardwired for human connection, whether that's yeah 
you and I chatting on the on the video calls or it's, you know, like talking to your partners on that and seeing your neighbours mow the lawn and saying, you know, like we're hardwired for that. And it comes from our comes from our prehistoric days. If you know, if you weren't connected to your tribe, you're dead, essentially. Um, yeah. and you know, we're not hiding from saber tooth tigers anymore, but we're still got that hard wiring where we need to be in a group or our brains go in this defense mode and we start sending the wrong chemicals out and then we start see that chemical imbalance and you know self-isolation is is bad on so many fronts but the first one's the mental health of being isolated and then the second front is it thickens your artery walls so we're going to see suicides rise by my prediction is 4x and then we're going to see heart attacks and strokes come up because people are isolating eating mm -hmm. crappy food and isolation is you know proven medically to increase the linings on your arteries so okay. we, need to, we need to do some work yeah absolutely and so what what are the impacts of feeling socially isolated then matt and not feeling connected to people yeah impacts of being socially isolated and connected uh, like you understand are very similar in the sense that when i don't have someone i can call on or when i don't like I'm a PT as well on the side and, and not being able to high five people is probably like the hardest thing I'm experiencing right now. I'm just begging to give someone a high five. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, we want all these interactions. Like I saw a friend out on the run the other day and I instantly went to high five her and then I had to like retract my hand. I'm like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, isolation is we get into a defense mode. So it's the same as when we talk about fight or flight, when we're isolating our minds constantly in this fight or flight mode. So we're like kind of like, what do we do? Where can we go? Mm -hmm. Can we engage in that conversation? session can we engage in this touch art the rules are very like no one really understands the rules yet nothing's legislated it's like can i have my mom and dad over can i can my partner bring her friend it's just it's a big ball of confusion mm, yeah it is it is so i guess what's um what what is connection then because you know i've had many speakers on over the last six days and of course it's definitely something that i i speak with my parents about and my clients about because it's that's key for parent-child relationships um so and every speaker has been talking about just how crucial connection is um in terms of just having a healthy mindset and uh, you know being being well so what exactly is connection i love it it's my favorite question yeah. connection is built off three pillars for us and this is done through kind of our discussions in our research it's empathy leadership and empowerment build connection so i'll explain each pillar really quickly yeah. so for each pillar it's for yourself and then for others so empathy for yourself is being able to understand you know okay this is where we're at at the moment this is why i feel like this not trying to change my emotions just trying to understand it so empathy can be cognitive emotional or physical empathy so cognitive is you know the ability to understand it emotional empathy is the ability to share in the emotions with someone and you know if you're going through a hard time I can share in those emotions of why you're upset mm -hmm. physical empathy is you know a really good example right now is if zoom crashes and one of your co-workers doesn't know how to fix it a physical sign of empathy would be to me to go offline with that particular co-worker and talk them through the steps on how to make it work and empathy is a two-sided coin, which a lot of people only ever look at the negative side of empathy. So when something is bad, you have to show empathy. But sure. the positive side of the empathy coin is just as important, if not more important. So a lot of people are going through changes in their business right now. And so, for some people, it's been really successful. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for instance, if your partner has... I don't know, let's, say, let's say your partner's a PT, right? Mm -hmm. And they've had to now pivot or change the an online platform and the center rise and members of the center rise and impact that they're having showing empathy would be to share in that you know that excitement and get really excited and joyous about what they're doing and how it's a positive so there's that positive empathy as well leadership is our second pillar so leading yourself uh if and I had a great conversation with someone yesterday. And if, you know, if you're having to tell people your values time and time again, like saying, I'm a man that's led by integrity, chances are you're probably not. You're trying to convince them and you're trying to convince yeah. yourself. So leadership is leading by example. Mm -hmm. Leadership is if you're the boss, you're sitting up there whipping your team to go faster, but leadership's getting in the trenches with them and getting the work done. Mm -hmm. And then leading leadership is in a job title. It's looking to your left looking to your right, seeing your kids are struggling. You know, I know you work a lot with families, seeing that this kid's struggling, how can we help them through it? And we talk we talk in schools quite often and one of the things we get from the school kids is this, this purpose element and it really puts a bee on my bonnet. Marketing and digital agencies are now pressing purpose more than ever. And then we've got year nine 
kids come out to me and saying, hey, Matt, I haven't really found my purpose yet and I'm feeling a bit pointless. I'm like, hey, whoa, <laughs> like you're in year nine for starters. Wow. Yeah. Purpose is something that it's a journey. You may get to 80 and find your purpose. You know, we've got people doing apprenticeships at 60 years old because they're like, oh, actually, I think I want to build houses. That's that's what I enjoy. Yeah. Um, so we talk heavily into having to dis distill your passion and then from your passion find kind of patterns that show up and then from your pattern, patterns you'll find your purpose and that speaks heavily into that leadership element. Yeah. And then thirdly is empowerment. So empowering yourself to actually go out into your community and make changes, speaking to your kids, not hiding from your kids how bad this is. Like this is a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is that we don't we want these kids because we've got a generation right now, my generation and possibly the kids slightly younger than me, have a real lack of resilience because they have their parents have hidden how bad certain things are from them their whole life. They haven't had to go through wars. They haven't had to get, we're in a war right now. We need to make sure that we're showing the kids, hey, yeah, this is pretty bad. Mum's just lost her job and dad's on the, you know, dad's almost unemployed as well, but we're going to get through this. This is what we're going to do to set in, yeah. set in, um, you know, systems and principles and start teaching the kids all these real life skills. And then we're going to see, the, I think we're going to see the most resilient youth come out of the back of this. And if, mm. If we're saying our kids right now don't have resilience, in five years we're going to say these kids almost have too much resilience. <laughs> they, can't, they can't feel anything. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's human connection to us and that gives us a framework to not only measure it, so you can measure your empathy, you can measure leadership, you can measure empowerment, but it also gives us a really hands-on way how to teach people to be more connected rather than just saying go talk to your neighbour and you'll be instantly more connected. So like you probably won't. You know? yeah. Go yeah. show empathy to your neighbour, you know, empathise that maybe she's an 80-year-old female, you know, this is my neighbour when I was a kid. She couldn't mow the lawn. So I used to mow her lawns for her, probably not by choice as a kid, it was more because my dad told me to, but that's an empathy model. And then leadership for your neighbour is they forgot to take the bins out. So instead of just laughing and going, oh, well, you got a stinky bin for a week, just grab their bin and wheel it out. And then empowerment, you know, that's an easy one. Empower your neighbours to do things that they can help. Yeah, yeah. And and where do you feel that people struggle the most with in those pillars in terms of connection? Definitely empathy. We're a very sympathetic society. So the, the definition or the, the, the changes, I guess, or the differences between sympathy and empathy are really quite bold, but a lot of people, uh, not intentionally, but unintentionally, you know, get confused between the two and Brene Brown everyone will know who Brene Brown is she's the queen of empathy uh she's got a really good explanation which I like to lean on a lot where sympathy right let's say we're walking along the farm and little Jimmy falls into the well sympathy is looking down at little Jimmy going oh mate that sucks like that must have hurt the fall and it must suck to be down that looks really dark and scary I hope you get out of it and you know I hope for better times for you whereas empathy would be going all right I'm coming down. We'll figure this out together. I'm going to sit with you uh, until we, we figure out how to get out of this hole. So we're very sympathetic and I think it's a beautiful, beautiful part of Australia is we are a very sympathetic nation. When someone goes through loss, job, they lose a friend, they lose a family member, whatever, we're very sympathetic and we'll be the first to bake them a lasagna and drop it off to them. Yeah. Um, but we're really poor at that empathy model. So I think out of the three pillars, Australia's got some of the best leaders in the world and we're very empowering. Uh, but, yeah, empathy where we fall apart yeah okay okay that makes a lot of sense so for for people that feel like they are lacking the connection well actually i'm interested to hear your opinion on connection with self versus connection with others yep because i think that's a huge uh topic as well yeah definitely so we can lean into those pillars again. So that's why we say when our pillars, they go both ways. So you have to show empathy for yourself and you have to show empathy for others. And it's the same with connection to yourself. So understanding what makes you tick. So, we, you know, in relationships, they talk a lot about love languages where I like to use love languages for connection as well. Like how do I feel more most connected to myself? Is it when I be selfish and go for a run in the morning, you know? yeah potentially it takes away from something else by saying yes to something we know we're always saying no to something else um that's when i feel most connected to myself when i hit the pavement yeah you know, for someone else it might be i don't know i keep leaning into it mowing the lawns you know or doing the dishes some people find dishes the most mindfulness thing they can do yeah. so that's that's being connected to yourself understanding what makes you happy what makes you tick what makes you feel like you can give back to society because we talk heavily into filling your own cup you know, before you fill others, I like to say, let's turn our cup into a bucket. And how we do that is by that personal development model. 
and personal development for me isn't going to a five day, five day seminar where one guy stands up on a stage and yells at you and you feel inspired for 24 hours and you leave. Personal development for me is learning these techniques, so learning about empathy, you know, potentially signing up for a Brene course if that's something you're into or going to a seminar like this where they're getting, like people listening to this right now, this is personal development for them, but a lot of us don't realise that. So that's how you can turn your glass into a bucket and that's where you can be most connected to yourself and then the more connected you are to yourself the more you can connect uh to others Mm -hmm. got it got it and so you said that you work in schools um and you go speak in schools quite a bit and there's definitely well everyone are parents on here what what are the i guess what are the topics that are really important for you to speak on there or what questions you know i know you got one on purpose from kids that you say but what are the other challenges that you feel like come through for children when you're speaking to them and and speaking to the teachers too yeah there's a whole ton but i think if we look at patterns again what shows up the most is definitely the purpose one um so that's something i really want to push on families in particular i know this is around happy home so families are listening like really making sure we're not pushing kids to find their purpose just try everything like try kicking the footy try sewing try violin like just try everything and something might something might stick and you go well i've found my passion now let's find patterns in that so for an example you know a good example i can give there is one young lady might find she's passionate for guitar and then we need to find the patterns within that. Is she into, you know, your acoustic music? Does she want to be in with the more classical guitar? And then that's where the patterns come and that's where we can develop a purpose. So that's the first one. Second one is around, uh, and the wording is always a bit hard, it's around that clicks at school or that that forming into their own little tribes and teachers are trying to break tribes apart and they're, they're doing it with good intention. But kids are going to form tribes kids are going to find their friendship groups and that's probably one of the best things that can come out of school not everyone you know being humanly connected to someone doesn't mean you have to be their best friend it just means you have to lean into our three pillars so there's nothing wrong with kids having different groups and we're talking to this at schools all the time like if that's if that's a group of friends there like you don't have to infiltrate that and become part of that group like this is your group here and as long as there's no you know arguments and fights between the two then it's all fair play when ter- when parents and teachers in particular try get in there and to break the groups up that's when we start seeing that really hostile environment between the kids because they're all separated and then it just goes into fight of the fittest essentially yeah. um, so yeah. that's the second one and then the third one is just so people learn differently uh, and we've found this in kids especially their kids learn different i was someone who undiagnosed but most definitely had add as a kid will still do uh my mind's just like bouncing i can't sit still this is probably the longest i've sat still for in a week and i've fidgeted a hundred times um so kids learn differently so some kids school's just not not going to work for them yeah. uh and instead of pulling them out it's probably the worst thing you can do from is just explain to them because these kids are feeling so so vulnerable and so beaten up because they're getting poor marks and they don't understand because kids don't understand that people learn differently. Yeah. Just explain to them that, hey, you're, you're maybe a hands-on learner. This is how we're going to get you a a, um, a tutor who knows more hands-on teaching. We'll do after-class stuff and you're going to be fine. We just need to have these discussions. And mm-hmm. I understand families can't all afford tutors, but the beautiful thing is when I was at school, YouTube wasn't a thing, but kids now can get on YouTube and learn anything they want. And most of it's, you know, pretty spot on. So yeah. keeping yeah. track on that and just, yeah, the three biggest things is lean into that human connection, ditch the word purpose and just find kids' passion. Don't yeah. push don't push them into any, just because you're a rugby league player doesn't mean my son's going to be a rugby league player. He might like netball. Who cares? Yeah. Just what they're passionate about. Yeah. Don't try to break groups up. And then that third element around just people learn differently. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And so for you then, because... I, I definitely work with a lot of children that have, you know, ADHD and ADD and various other diagnoses. And school definitely is one of those challenging environments for these kids. And so for you, just for parents that are watching that have children in that arena, you know, what what was helpful for you when it was tough to focus or it was tough to connect with people or, you know, what was really your saving grace or what did you lean on when it was tough yeah, I was, I'm really, really fortunate. My family is, you know, I couldn't possibly ask for uh, better parents. You know, as a kid, you always say, oh, you're the best dad ever. Uh, I generally had the best parents ever. Um, mm-hmm. They kind of understood that 
I wasn't learning how I was. I started year eight and nine or year eight really and I was like crushing it. I was A's, well not A's, whatever the schooling reporting system is these days, 3.2s um, and I was going really well and then when it hits year nine and the whole learning structure changes okay. and you're now more exam based, you've got to fill out and you know, uh, you've got to do assignments. I, was just, I fell apart, the wheels fell off completely. So just having someone explain that to me was really beneficial. I had a I had a year seven teacher who I'm still in contact with now, who was probably the first person to take that in and explain that people learn differently. Okay. And he was well ahead of his time, I, I think. And I think it's because he himself has kids that definitely learn differently through their own uh, circumstances. So he was ahead of his time saying, hey, guys, like some people aren't going to learn through doing exams. Some people aren't going to learn from cramming for 48 hours before they go into their uh, end of school exams yeah. and just explain that. So that was that's probably the best technique I can advise people to use because yeah. kids don't know, like they're so impressed. They don't understand that, hey, Susie and Johnny learn completely differently. We yeah. can give the, we can give them the same amount of material and Susie will crush it and Johnny will fail and Johnny will think he's dumb. And yeah. that's and because no one's ever gone, hey mate, like this is how Susie learns. You need to be more tactical. Maybe you're a trainee. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It all makes sense, right? Yeah. When you get older and you see those patterns. So did you feel did you feel disconnected when you were young then? You know, because I didn't feel that you were segregated or isolated by friends or by teachers or by anybody else around you because I know that that's certainly something that the families um, I work with and parents that come to me struggle with a lot is that yep. their children do feel dumb like we've already touched on, but they do feel isolated and alone because other people have detected there's just something wrong with them. Yeah, definitely. I was bullied like horrendously as a school kid. Um, I used to, I remember I used to go to the computer rooms at lunchtime and watch like the live surf cam from my local surf breakers. I was like, I just didn't want to sit with people. So yeah, I was, I was really disconnected and it's funny now I'm probably more connected to a couple of the guys that I went to school with than I was when I was seeing them every day. Sure. Um, but yeah, I was definitely felt disconnected and I think it was because I didn't fit in. Yeah. Uh, I always felt like a misfit and, and to some degree kids kind of want to be a misfit now because of what we see on TV and see in movies. But, uh, yeah, someone asked me the other day, if you because I left school in the start of year 11, if yeah. you could go speak to young Matt now, what would you say? I'd say stay in school <laughs> and not to get my education. Like that's the least of the reasons why I'd stay in school. I'd stay in school because they're our, like that's where we're moulding who we are and who our connections are and how we connect to other people. And I missed out on two years of that and I went straight into a workforce where I was surrounded by, you know, middle-aged men. Okay. Yeah every day um so yeah i felt disconnected i didn't really have a solution while i was in school but again i, I leaned back into the last answer if someone had told me that i was just someone who learned differently uh, i think i would have felt a lot better about who i was i had a lot of self-confidence issues mm -hmm. um and yeah it all related to that aspect like i was by no stretch of the imagination failing but the goals or the aspirations i had set were just unachievable uh and i think that comes back to society's expectations. So mm -hmm. yeah, just, just getting parents to have open conversations with their kids, be like, hey, you know, maybe you're not an A student. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. And I think that then it really plays into how parents just need to figure out who their children are and also who their children are not. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge conversation that I have with parents all of the time, um, especially yeah. ones that have various diagnoses. It's really important to, to that pure acceptance piece and, you know, meeting them where they're at, which is what your parents did, obviously, with your yeah. learning style and who you were and who you weren't. Yeah, I think it's really important just to not wait until like and for, for young adults as well right now like don't wait till your parents are on their deathbed to really get to know them like find out i love hearing stories and i don't get them all the time but i love hearing stories about my kids when they were my, my kids my parents when they were my age like yeah. get to know your parents before before you're forced to because they are on their deathbed and the same goes for parents like get to know your kids when they're young like yeah. they're so interesting and you hear parents say it all the time and i'm always very very cautious of how i talk as someone who doesn't have kids but we hear parents say all the time i love it when my kid has a personality and it kind of stops there um you know for my friends that have kids yeah your kids got a personality let's learn about it let's, let's figure out what their personality exactly is not the fact that they just have one because that is cute as hell but let's figure out what it is what makes them tick what's their love language yeah, yeah. Kind of stuff. 
yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's move on to, you know, the whole mental health aspect. And so for you, what exactly is, does it mean to have a healthy uh, mindset and to be mentally healthy? Yeah, so mental health is something that it really, again, I, f I feel like I, I'm repeating myself. I got to be on the binary about because we hear a lot of people say like one in four Australians will deal with their mental health. Like, well, no, <laughs> we're all going to deal with our mental health. This is whether we're in a good frame of mind or a poor frame yeah. of mind. So mental health for me is just being able to manage the influx that we have. So I always use an analogy of a house electrical system and just bear with me as I explain it. So... When electricity is coming into a house from the mains, it's flowing in at a you know, high rate, high current, all that sort of jazz. And the house's responsibility is to manage that power and send it to different devices, to power my laptop right now, to power my toaster, to power my oven, etc. And we've got this thing called a circuit breaker. So when something's faulty, my toaster's faulty or too much power is coming in, circuit breaker will flick to keep everyone in the house safe so we don't get shocked. I like to think as mental health is that that circuit breaker is your mental health and it's your responsibility. If too much power is coming in, too much information, too much stimulus, the world's moving so fast, especially right now, like we're getting a news conference or a press release every half an hour. We're getting yeah. kids at school, at kids' home, who, who really knows? Mm -hmm. uh, so if that's one case, you need to flick your circuit breaker. And then on the other hand, if your toast is faulty, i.e. something in your life right now is just taking away from your good health, mm -hmm. be it a relationship, be it, you know, uh, any situation in your life that's causing grief, again, you need to flick that circuit breaker and disconnect that device. So circuit breakers can be something, you know, for kids, for example, a circuit breaker might be a five-minute video on YouTube or it might be kicking the footy with dad or mum out the back. Uh, and for an adult, same thing. Like for me, if I if I need to flick my circuit breaker, it's definitely a run. Okay. Yesterday I had I just had to push my computer away and go out for a run. I just had to switch off and, and hit the pavement. So people need to find, A, how their stress talks because we all have a stress language. Uh, mine's cleaning the kitchen. So if I'm cleaning the kitchen, you know I'm stressed. <laughs> yeah. Never yeah. happens otherwise. Yeah. Uh, so you need to find where your best shows are. Kitchen clean, you know. Yeah, yeah. If you, yeah. You walk in it's spotless. It's like, oh no. <laughs> um, yeah. So finding out how your stress shows up, and then finding what your circuit breaker is, is that's mental health to me. So we could go right into what mental illness is and the chemical imbalances and whatnot. But I think just knowing what your mental health is is much more important for everyday Australians rather than knowing what your mental illness is. And that's the point of, that's why I always bold and underline proactive. You know, if you get sick in Australia, we've got one of the best medical systems ever. But if you're not sick and you just want to be the healthiest version of yourself possible, we're shocking. Like naturopaths uh, don't even get government help anymore. Like all these great businesses and I guess ways of life uh, you know, not not being helped by the government because it's oh, it's proactive, like we'll wait until they're dying before you step in. And the same goes for like your fitness. If you have someone who gets really, really fit, they get a six pack. Do we just stop training? <laughs> it's like, no, we continue on. So that's what mental health is. It's something we need to manage every single day, every hour off the day. Uh, and it's around being proactive and making sure you've got resources, you've got support, you've got human connection at every facet of your life. So you don't need reactive measures. Yeah, yeah. I really like that analogy. I think that's a really perfect one mm. uh, to find your circuit breaker. That's yeah. Yeah, really cool. I like that one. Uh, so we've we've touched on a fair bit, Matt, but is in, in starting to close on up, is there anything that you feel like we haven't touched on that's really important for people, parents to know right now um, in your eyes? I'm just uh, what I'm really passionate about is and and I say into the, the demographic of families, I'm just really passionate that parents don't protect their kids right now. And I don't mean that in the sense of protect them from danger. Of course, every parent protects their kids from danger, but don't protect them from the information that's coming because I think it's really, really vital. And, you know, I could be wrong and we've all been wrong before, but I think right now we've got a really good opportunity to show our kids the resilience we have as parents, show our kids that, hey, yeah, mum just lost a job and dad's on the brink of losing his as well. But this is what we're going to do to keep everyone moving. This is what we're going to do to keep our families safe and fed. Uh, not only is it going to build that, that figure up, like 
if that was my family and my parents sat me down and said, hey, we've both just lost our jobs, but this yeah. is how we're going to get through it, I'd be like, wow, you guys are amazing. Like I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to come to you with anything that happens in my life for yeah. the rest of my life. Um, but it also distills that resilience in the kids because they then, you know, we've, and it's really sad. Like last year we had a child in our network, 14 years of age, take his own life because a girl broke up with him. And it's, that's where the resilience isn't isn't there. And, you know, there's definitely more to, to every story, but that essentially was the straw that broke the camel's back. And unfortunately it took this young man's life because we, we don't have this resilience built in and it's 110% not the parent's fault. But as a society, we're protecting kids from facts. It's like, oh, you go on the radio. This news broadcast isn't safe for kids. Why isn't it safe for kids? Kids should be hearing about what's happening in the community because they're going to be the ones running it in a few mm -hmm. years' time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably my my biggest takeaways for parents is to just not protect your kids from the news. Protect them from danger, but don't protect them from what's happening. Get your facts from the right places to make sure they're factual and then sit your kids down to say, hey, look, like this is what's happening. We can't go see grandma and granddad because they are old and this virus can kill them. Uh, rather than we can't go see them because they're sick at the moment, we don't want to get them sicker. Like tell them like this, this could take their life. So we're being safe because then when they're the leaders, they are the leaders of tomorrow. Then they know to take things seriously and they know how to work around the the resilience model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I guess it's really that solution focused mentality too. When you've got your parents that are willing to have those tough conversations with mm -hmm. them. And there's no doubt that resilience is always bred and and created through adversity. So um, yeah. this definitely an adverse time with with a lot of potential lessons if we so choose. So mm. I like to finish off with two questions, Matt. So first yeah. question is, um, what in your personal life, in your world, what have been the, the opportunities and the incredible experiences or the beautiful parts in the last couple of weeks that you've had that probably wouldn't have happened if COVID-19 didn't come here and didn't happen? Yep, I love that one. So what we're doing now is we've pivoted our whole workshop and I'm very cautious of where work, uh, using the word pivot. To pivot to me is changing your business for good. We're just changing little moments off it right now. We're changing to be an online platform. So I'm, re I'm really excited that we've had the opportunity and it's, and it's really beautiful to watch. We've taken our workshops that we normally run in corporates, schools and community events. We've put it all together and we've created a seven-day program that people log into um, that kicks off next Monday that is just an hour a day. It's really simple. There's a task associated to it. Uh, and the feedback just from people reading what the course is about, no one's even started it yet, uh, is is really, really cool. And it's, and it's making people connect with their network to say, hey, like, I don't need to do the course. I just read through the brief and I already feel like I can connect better with you, which is if we don't have to exist, that's when I know we're successful. When we shut down because no one needs our services, that's I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I'm happy. Yeah, awesome. <coughs> and and for you, what does a happy home look and feel like? Happy home. A happy home is my child <clears throat> is my childhood really, you know, and it's gotta have equal parts. Yeah. <laughs> I sound like Mary, uh, Miss Mary Robbins or whatever her name was, uh, Mary Poppins. It's, it's going to have equal parts of empathy, leadership and empowerment. And I think, um, and what I really, really love is, you know, society finally is changing their perspective of the father has to be the leader. And I think that's unreal. Like, I know my mum was definitely the leader a lot of the time in my household, but, you know, my dad worked away my whole childhood. Um so I think that's really, really cool is seeing equal parts of empathy, leadership and empowerment. And for a lot of households 10, 20, 30 years ago, the mother was generally the empathetic one and the father was more of the like, no, you've done the wrong thing, you know, we're going to reprimand you. Where it's like gender doesn't play a role in that anymore and I think that's a happy home where both parents have got equal parts of empathy, both parents are the leaders and they're, you know, they're a team and a fortified team. Mm -hmm. I think um, happy homes for me is when mum and dad or my mum and dad and dad or whatever the situation is, is a fortified team and everything that, you know, even if mum makes a poor decision, dad backs it 100%. That's a happy home. And then thirdly, uh, the parents are empowering the kids to do, to chase what they like, to chase their, their um, passion, not push them into a purpose. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Definitely mum and dad being a strong team just changes the household dynamic, dynamic tenfold. Yeah. Massive. 
Yeah, it's a big one. Thank you. So, Matt, if people want to get on board, they feel like they want to find out about the program or the Human Connection Project, then where is the best place for them to go? Yep, just probably the website's got everything. So it's just connection.org.au. Okay. Super simple one. Super simple. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks for sharing all of that and those Thank really you those three pillars of what connection is that really then give our mind something to focus to because when we know what to focus on and create more of that mm. then that can change starts to happen in our lives instead of focusing on what we don't want it's far more effective to focus on what we do want so definitely. That, that definitely helps if connection is something that we're struggling with or that we need more of so i really appreciate your time um mm. and yeah have an awesome kickoff next monday with your program mm. Thank you. Yeah, you too. I think what you've done is fantastic. So hats off to you. Thanks so much. See you, Matt. Bye, everyone. Bye.